Welcome to The Impossible, where we empower others to face the impossible, inspire them to be impossible, and motivate them to do the impossible. You guys know we spend a lot of time on this show talking about how to find opportunity in every challenge, how to find strength in the face of every battle, how to reject any form of limitation placed on you, and to find a higher level of potential in the face of those challenges. And in doing so, once you find that potential within yourself, you find it in everyone around you. And there's few stories that are more embodying of that very message, that very mindset, than so many of those who have battled childhood cancer. And this month of September being Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and leading up to our final push into the Columbus Nationwide Children's Hospital Marathon. We are honored to bring you guys from now till the marathon so many incredible, impossible stories of those who have battled childhood cancer from many different perspectives. And we are extremely honored today to kick off this next series in the podcast by having the one and only Desney Croc on the podcast today. She is a mom of two children who have battled cancer. But so much more than that, she used the challenge she faced in those circumstances to build an organization that has been helping and serving those who battle childhood cancer in countless ways throughout our area and so far beyond. She is a true hero when it comes to this fight. She inspires and motivates kids. She builds community amongst them, and she provides countless research dollars to help drive forward life-saving research, development, and growth in the world of battling childhood illness. So we are honored to have Desney Croc on the podcast today. Mm -hmm. You guys are going to love this story. Definitely stick to the end to hear everything. She's got some really unique perspectives just as a mom and as a caregiver about not just the physical battle of childhood cancer, but especially the mental health and emotional health side of everything that you go through. So we're going to dive into all that. But uh, Desney, thank you for being on today. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for that incredible introduction. I sound really awesome. Hey, we just speak the truth how it is. That's what we do. <laughs> and you are awesome. I mean, we were talking about, you guys remember back episode, I think it was five episode no episode 10 i think with ginger mcconnell we were talking about her before we started the podcast mm -hmm. and i would rank you right up there with her as somebody who's just taken That's so much honor. challenge so much pain and turned it around and built so much positivity from it thank you that is <laughs> that is one of the best compliments you could ever yeah. give me in my in my life yeah well we uh you helped me through a lot when i was battling cancer over 10 years ago now and you're still helping kids to this day. You know, you've learned in real time from helping your own kids battle this disease. And I, th I always see it in you as well, this piece that we've found where being able to support and build up other kids, being able to serve them when they're kind of in that darkest hour of facing that diagnosis and help their, their pain and their suffering to be just a little bit less is one of the most... I think empowering, motivating, fulfilling things you could ever experience. It's it's the only way I can see to give back. Mm -hmm. That uh, that's what it all boils down to yeah. is that I was given so much love and compassion um, when I first was going through this. That there's no other way. There's no other way. Absolutely, and we feel the same way. That's why we do everything we do here. So take us back all the way to the beginning of this journey. How did your journey, your battle against childhood cancer first begin? So my eldest child was um, about, I think, a year and a half um, when she had pneumonia, supposedly. Um, that's what the diagnosis was. We had gone in multiple times for this cough that just would not go away and a mm -hmm. fever that would not go away. We fought it day after day after day. And um, her doctor got her a chest X-ray to see what was going on and um, it looked like either it was a collapsed lung or pneumonia. 
and she, the doctor oh god love her she she looked at me with such panicked eyes and said you need to take her to the er now i barely had a you know i think i had maybe a diaper or two and i wasn't planning on being there that long so i didn't really grab the full diaper bag with bottle or anything and and I had given her some ibuprofen before we went to the doctor. And so we went over to the to the ER and I called my husband and I called my mom and I said, hey, we're over at the ER, it's an emergency, blah, blah, blah. And uh, when we got over there, she was fine. The fever had broken because of the ibuprofen. This is the way it had gone for days is that you give her ibuprofen and she's fine. So she's standing there in the, um, in the, uh, emergency room with her shirt up over her head going bobby bobby dot to everybody who walked that was how yep. she said uh, belly button yeah and um so you know nobody took us seriously that that this kid was sick mm-hmm. and um so yeah we finally um we finally the ibuprofen were off hours later and they suddenly realized that this was actually an emergency situation that we weren't just some crazy parents in there overreacting they took us, they, they said that we could either go to Charleston or we could go to um, Nationwide. And we opted for Charleston because this is a breathing issue. So we thought the closest one was better. Yeah. Um, it was out of network, but we didn't care. We just, we needed help for our kid. So um, for seven months and five, four surgeries, four or five surgeries, we were fighting pneumonia and then an incurable cyst. That's what they thought. They finally removed that portion of the lung that the cyst was in and um, discovered that it was a very rare form of cancer called pleuropulmonary blastoma. I've learned a lot of big words mm-hmm. through this journey. Yeah, you do. You do for sure. <laughs> that, that was the first big word that I learned to spell, which was pleuropulmonary blastoma. And um, uh we found out it was extremely rare and that it was genetic and that was all we knew was that it was genetic but we knew nothing more than that Um, this was in 2008 I was also um, I found out two weeks before that that I was pregnant with my second child Ace and so needless to say um, this was important for us to to figure out Um, we went through nine months of 10 months of treatment Um, it was an aggressive cancer so therefore it was an aggressive form of treatment Mm -hmm. Um, and they were giving adult doses of chemotherapy Um, we had some close calls and um, but we got through that Um, we got through that by the grace of God in all honesty Um, a lot of people go through a child's illness and the couple end up not together at the end of it because it is extremely mentally straining. Um, but fortunately, I'm an empath. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so while I was feeling very, very martyred, um, I was the one who always went to the hospital. I was the one who always was home. I was the one who gave up my career. I was the one who was with her every step of the way. Um, In fact, I only missed two rounds of chemo and that was because I was giving birth to the other one. Um, So it was really easy for me to say, oh, my husband doesn't do squat. And then I was home, it was, we were actually at home at one time and my husband wasn't in bed and I got up and walked out to the living room and I saw him scrolling through pictures of our daughter sobbing and it occurred to me then that yes I'm the one going through all of this with her but he has to watch his child and his wife go away while he continues to work continues to try to pay twice the bills on half the income And he's struggling to keep the home going and to, you know, try to, to, to be there as much as he can in Charleston. So he would, he would leave a full day's work, drive to Charleston, spend an hour or two with us, drive back home, take care of the pets, go to bed, get up, go back to work all day and do it all over again. And so he 
it, it occurred to me, okay, he has his own struggles that he's going on. And I think that saved our marriage because it, it suddenly very, became very clear that I was not alone in this. And that was a huge realization, huge realization. Because I didn't know anybody that had a kid with cancer. I mean, I had no idea. There was nobody. So there was, it, it was me. And so, you know, everybody was saying, I had great community support. I did. Um, but when the treatment was over, that is when my mental health started to fall very badly. Um, I, you know, they, they, you go from, you go from treating and fighting the battle and you're, you're getting, um, all these scans and all these doctor's appointments and you're, you're surrounded by medical professionals that are telling you it's working, it's working, it's working, or we got to change something else. And you're going from fight mode. And then they say, you're done. See you in three months. And meanwhile, you don't know what's happening to your kid inside it's in her little tiny body you know she was in the when we finished treatment she was in weight wise the fifth percentile in weight but fortunately was still in the the 35th percentile for height she was still growing but any weight that she would put on would go up so you know she looked ill oh i'm losing the puppy (laughs) and um so I would look at this little bald head this little tiny kid and just wonder what's growing inside of her and that is when the PTSD started and that is when the depression and the anxiety started and I knew that it was a problem and I was a psych major so I, I know you know about stigmatism and how it's really shouldn't be and all that stuff but when it's happening to you you're, you're looking for permission to invalidation for these feelings and for someone to say, it's okay to get help. And I knew that, but yet I didn't mm-hmm. know that. And um, I was in so many doctor's offices, uh, my own doctor's offices too, because um, I have my thyroid removed thanks to the gene mutation that we all share. Um, so I was in doctor's offices repeatedly crying and not a single one of them said, hey, I think you need help. You need to talk to your doctor and get some help. Nobody said that, not one. <laughs> and I was, at a, I was in a special mom's group that a friend of mine invited me to. Um, these are all people who, who have got medically challenged kids in our area. And we would go to dinner once a month. And they're all sitting there very casually, calmly talking about what medications they're on and antidepressants and stuff. And I'm like, how did you get your doctor to prescribe that? Because how did how did you make them realize you need help? And they said, honey, you have to just tell them. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I tell you, my happy pills is what I call them because uh, without them, you know, I'm a basket case, but <laughs> um, that has helped me immensely. And seeing how my children um, are now older, teens, and going, you know, they were going through puberty and so forth, there's an increased amount of suicide rates in childhood cancer survivors because of the late term effects and the constant worry about everything and so my goal was to make sure that their mental health was taken care of first before it became a problem so when Bridget was preteen I just took her to the therapist she wasn't having any problems or anything just so that she knows she can do that and we went a couple times and everything was fine and um, so then You know, she went through being a teen pretty well, but um, she came to me a year ago and said, I'm I'm tired of being a mascot because I have used her to promote Brava, to promote childhood cancer, and she is feeling like a mascot. 
And so she has uh, decided that she does not want to do that anymore. And so we're getting her in therapy and and I've stopped. Well, I'm using her now, but <laughs> <laughs> she she knows it's still part part of the bargain. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was her deal. Um, I had my second child while Bridget was um, going through chemo, a round of chemo. And um, we had enough knowledge about this type of cancer to know to get a baseline um, chest x-ray on on ACE. And um, we were fine. We, we got the scans as they recommended to make sure that she remained cancer-free. We got past the age of four, which was where they they said, okay, it's it's much lower risk of her getting that type of cancer. Um, but in 2009, they learned about Dicer-1 gene mutation. And that's the mutation that they have. And there is a, an entire spectrum of types of childhood cancer that is on that spectrum. Um, in 2010, we were part of a National Cancer Institute study on Dicer-1, and we were the third family in the study. So we are paving the way of sorts for kids. So when both of my kids were diagnosed, or when, when Ace was diagnosed with um, her eye issue, I've had three different residents ask me if they can write papers on her, oh, wow. on him. And um, so I said, sure, absolutely. Suddenly, now on the protocol for Dicer 1, they're saying you need to start having your kids get eye exams. Um, When both of my kids were diagnosed with thyroid nodules, all of a sudden the protocol is everybody needs to get start getting thyroid scans, ultrasounds on a regular basis. So we're paving the way and that's great research is fantastic that's what we want to do that's Mm -hmm. that's what how we can contribute but um it's exhausting it would be nice to have some answers before they (laughs) before they happen but yeah yeah i appreciate you sharing all that and there's a lot of good stuff to unpack there Um, we'll go back to some of the beginning of what you talked about Mm -hmm. first i want to ask like with Bridget Mm -hmm. being in the ER and then you go through these battles where they think it's one thing that it's really not. We always like to ask people and just touch on what was that moment like where the doctor's looking you in the eye telling you your daughter has cancer? How do you take in that news and how do you move forward with it? That's an excellent question. Um, When we were told that she had cancer um i i was at home and um, my husband had come home from lunch for lunch because he had a gig and yeah so he had to he came home for lunch for a bit and um i called the doctor and got the because i had a message to call him so i called him and and he said that uh, he wanted me to meet with an oncologist and that they think it is a, a cancer and I said, okay, and you know, I'm just trying to take it all in and all the information of when and where and when to go. And I hung up and I, my brother was there. He's the one who had given me the information because my phone had been cut off. Uh, my home phone had been cut off because remember seven months worth of doctor's bills and hospital stays and half of our income on one person's in you know on and double the bills and um so my brother got a call at our office and he came up to let me know to call the doctor and he he gave me his cell phone so that I could make that call and so my brother left having heard the conversation and went home and told my mom I told Bob and um you know we were just in cleanup mode pack mode because it was the next day that we were going to the doctor and um, my mom came in and I was sitting on the floor picking up toys sobbing just absolute sobbing because you know my 
beautiful little two-year-old blonde-haired kid has cancer that's lung cancer none of us smoked that's not fair (laughs) that's not fair and so it it was it was gut-wrenchingly painful is I guess the only thing I could say and um, we went to the doctor and we were in fight mode by the time we that you know by the time the next day rolled around we were in fight mode what's what are we doing what are the chances what's the protocol and oh by the way I'm pregnant we got to make sure this is okay and our poor doctor Dr. Chauvenet he he uh, he said you're pregnant okay but you can't have the baby while you're <laughs> while you're in treatment I'm like okay I won't but um yeah so it, it was it was devastating so when we go to round two with ace ace was seven when uh he was diagnosed and um he had what i thought was a lazy eye and i was drifting and so you know he had a a well child visit coming up pretty soon so we just um decided to wait and we went we went to the well child visit and um there was complete mass in there darkness they couldn't see anything so they said we need to get you into the hospital tomorrow so we went up there and um he's getting an eye exam and he does the, the good eye and all is well and then they switch over to the other eye and ask can you read the letters on there and he said I can't even see the screen he was completely blind in that eye and never bothered to tell me (laughs) so isn't it unbelievable like the just inherent natural resilience that kids have to where like that can be a thing and they just don't even like think it's worth mentioning sometimes wow it's, Uh, it's unbelievable well, you know, he, I'd been telling him, oh, it's probably just a lazy eye. Yeah, you yeah, know, your yeah. dad had that. Eh, it's OK. We'll get a patch, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we went. The, they uh, came in and said that uh, it was there was a mass in the eye and um, they believe it is a certain type of tumor, medulla epithelioma, medulla epithelioma. And that it was not going to be treated by chemo or radiation that the only way to to treat it is to remove it and in my mind i could only think woohoo sorry i probably no, blew your ear good. To- <laughs> you're all good <laughs> i i was like yes no chemo we don't have to have chemo no chemo take the eye but no chemo but it wasn't registering to me that no chemo means that if the surgery doesn't work we're out of luck and so my reaction was extremely not appropriate um and the doctor kept trying to just like he was really okay you understand we're going to be taking the your child's eye yeah go right ahead okay when can we get this done and there was no tears or anything because we'd been through this and all i could heard was no chemo yeah i I'm so glad that you tell that story and bring that perspective because it highlights such an important piece of this entire experience of childhood cancer. You get so sick and you go through so much struggle and suffering from whether it's chemo or radiation or whatever it is for that individual, you become so numb (laughs) and, and, and your entire perspective on what's a challenge shifts Mm -hmm. and in many ways that can actually be very good very positive but in other ways like like you just bring up sometimes it can i don't want to even say it was wrong but it can just shift your perspective to a point that it's hard to go back and recognize the significance of what what's happening right because i think most people would expect you to say that like that was your deepest fear like your biggest trauma come to life you went through one child that had cancer and now the second would be infinitely even more crushing Mm -hmm. and i'm sure in some ways it was but i 100 percent understand how that could be your mentality Mm -hmm. hearing the words no chemo and thinking oh it's just an eye he's got a spare you know we'll be fine we'll move on we'll get it done and 
I think that would be, I think that's got to be so staggering for people who have never battled through something like this to even hear, or to even comprehend. But I 100% understand mm-hmm. like how you can get there. You know, in my journey, I had gone through sepsis two times before I had my really bad one when I was on ECMO to the point that like when I'm getting ready to go on ECMO and I'm in the ER and they're converting it into a surgical suite. I'm just like, oh, this is, you know, to me, it was normal at that point. Mm-hmm. Same with like, even still today, I'm, I'm this way and that my heart randomly went into AFib last week for no reason whatsoever. And I was like, well, my heart's out of rhythm, but let me go run another mile. I'll finish this training run. I'll go home, take a shower and then I'll go to the ER. <laughs> you know, it's like, I just never considered it to be this big thing. Right. Um, and come to find out it is a pretty serious thing and I probably shouldn't have done that but you know it's it's just it so dramatically shifts your perspective on on what can be a challenge and what what's not a challenge and um, the relativity of everything yeah. and I think we can bring a lot of good from that I really truly mm-hmm. do but I think it that is such a powerful story because it highlights such a significant piece that a lot of people don't think about mm-hmm. in this battle and something else you talked about earlier that I really, really liked that you brought up and said it because it was my personal experience and it was something Austin experienced. Austin wasn't a child when he battled cancer, but he's still a very young adult. And I think children in, in the adolescent young adult group share a lot of the similar struggles. And I think in some ways there's things that kids battle that the AYA doesn't battle. And there's some things, a lot of things AYA battles that kids don't necessarily battle as mm-hmm. much just because you're in different periods of your life. But one thing we really experience is that the hardest part oftentimes begins when you're done. Mm -hmm. And you explained it perfectly. It was exactly my experience back in my day, even, and especially in your day, there was no transitions of care. Mm -mm. And especially in your days of battling through this, there was mental health was not a discussion. Right. Like people laughed at you if you brought up those words, you know, fortunately we're getting, I think better and better about it as a society, but especially back then it wasn't even something that was considered. Mm -hmm. And for me it was, you know, I was actually for the most part, really strong, really positive in like a really good spot while I was battling through all of this. And then the second it ends, just like you said, you go from, you go from fighting for your life every single day and when you have that kind of mentality it gives you such a deep level of purpose and meaning that you can't find that in day to day life unless you work to create that and that's another big thing of what we do with the podcast and with the business we help people create purpose for their life because that's the only solution it's the only antidote from slipping into that that darkness that can come when you don't have a purpose yeah. Equally significant. Not only that, but it's empowerment. Yeah. It's you're you're in battle mode, battle mode, battle mode, and then all of a sudden you're supposed to sit back and do nothing. Mm-hmm. And um, it, you gotta you gotta have some sort of control over your life. And this is the way Brava was the way that we empower ourselves to fi- continue the fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and it not only that, but we encourage the parents to join us when once they're done with their journey and several of them have where they can join our committee and 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 feel empowered and emboldened and able to contribute and it it's very helpful that's amazing and that's that's exactly the solution is you offer them a path forward you offer them a purpose Mm -hmm. it may not ultimately end up being their life's defining purpose but it's a step it's a direction it's Mm -hmm. something they can move in because that's the hardest part that we both experienced. And I, I was really focused on when Austin came out of his first round of treatment. Um, and we had many discussions talking about how, hey, when this finishes, like, that's going to be the hardest part. And it was. It absolutely was. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I'm so uh, thankful and impressed to, to hear and see what you do. Um, because, that, <laughs> again, coming out of the treatment was you know, oh, you're in remission. And I was like, great. And I had a nice little vacation after, after my first, uh, remission, uh, call. And 
came, you know, and honestly, I was still somewhat distracted <laughs> during the vacation because mm-hmm. I was just like, I, I don't have another appointment. Like, it's three months from now. And I'm like, yeah. all right, sweet. That's great, I think. And, and then I came back, started working again. And that was that was quite a quite a long and harsh fall that I found myself in mm-hmm. a bit of a bit of weightlessness and it was it was impossible performance in working with Matt and and really engaging with uh, the community that we've built here uh, with Team Impossible is what app I mean it it is what saved me mm-hmm. I mean, there was there was not a whole lot of work that I had done on the personal level to to the degree of what I've been able to accomplish now personally. But at that point, it was definitely, I, I needed a lot of kind of arms and shoulders to, mm-hmm. to rest up on. And uh, yeah, yeah. And here I am now and and with with that purpose that you need to look for, like like, like Matt described. And and ultimately it's um, it's been very, very beneficial. Good. So. I'm glad to hear that. One of the things I did notice, um, Bridget was a toddler when she was diagnosed. Ace was in elementary school. The mental challenges between the two of them is immense. Mm -hmm. Bridget just thought that this is what all kids go through. You know, this is nothing different from everyone else. Every other kid she saw was in the hospital too. So, you know, this wasn't a big deal. Didn't know any difference. So when it was done with her, there was nothing. There was was no big deal. Mm -hmm. Ace, when it was done with him, he he was missing an eye. That was very obvious. Mm-hmm. That is a big plaster on your face that you never can get rid of. And um, so the, the mental health challenges that he has gone through versus what Bridget has gone through is immense. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of PTSD. And it, it made me aware very much that that the older kids the young adults definitely i think have it far worse than the younger kids now the parents have to entertain a child <laughs> a toddler yeah, yeah, in a, yeah. in the uh, hospital and try to keep them from pulling their tubes out and all that <laughs> stuff um it, it's it's a different challenge yeah. um but the older the older the kids i definitely think that there's um a strong mental health component that needs to be addressed with those kids that are in school currently surrounded by their peers Um, we never really had any issues with him getting bullied or anything like that because the Mm -hmm. kids all knew Um, I had gone into the school prior to uh, the surgery to take his eye and explain to his classmates what's going to happen that it's going to be okay that you know he's going to be missing an eye and he's going to be wearing a patch for a while and maybe eventually he'll be able to show you the eye and one of my memories on Facebook popped up saying that um I was carrying an eye in my purse today (laughs) (laughs) because he finally got courageous enough that he was showing the kids in his classroom his eye and it popped out in class oh no (laughs) like a (laughs) prosthetic eye that is a phone call you never want to get is um your kid uh lost their eye I've got it in a Ziploc baggie. <laughs> so I carried my purse around until we, or it, I carried my kid's eye around in my purse until we got to the hospital like oh, a few man. days ago, or a yeah. few days later. But yeah, um, things, things you'd never think yeah. you'd go through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, I often thought, oh, wow. um, you know, when you were going through this, Matt, you know, you were a senior, junior. Yeah, senior in high school. Senior in yeah. high school. And, you really touched my heart because I knew your battle was hard and then you had all those teenage drama things too. You know, you had your prom that you were missing. You had sports that you were missing. And and I remembered what Bridget went through and I thought, that that's that's got to be awful. That's got to be awful. Yeah. Well, it's, it's why I say that. I, I don't think one's better or worse no. even. It's hard to use those words. I think... The challenges are just a lot different. Like you say, Bridget grew up and that's kind of the only world she knew for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in some ways that can be a helpful thing. 
But in other ways, like like you say, it can make it infinitely more difficult on the parents sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was being in that age, especially as like the senior in high school, I literally received um, my college acceptance letter two weeks before my diagnosis. Wow. And it was like, you know, at the time it was like my dream college, my dream situation moving forward and everything I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden that gets ripped from you. And when you're in that, when you're in high school, like that's your whole world. Like there, there's, you don't see five years down the, at least most kids don't, yeah. you don't see five years down the future. You don't see <laughs> 10 years down the future. You know, you're not looking at all of this life ahead of you. You just see like what this year holds and what, you know, what's coming up, what's coming next. And actually at first it was, I, I was really blessed to have just an amazing support community. I mean, from every single person, the people we lived around, the people I went to school with, like everybody in this. I mean, you know what an oh, yeah. unbelievable community this is. And that's why I've always said I got the opportunity to witness the very best of humanity. And what I realized very early on was that like I could show up and I could put a smile on my face and that would give positive motivation to people. Mm -hmm. And that was a very powerful, rewarding thing for me. And so that was something that like really drove me for the, from those first three months before amputation and um, what was really interesting is after amputation, it, it just so happened to coincide that I was diagnosed in February, began treatment a week later, and then was on chemo for a little over three months, graduated high school on May 24th. My amputation was on June 10th. So it was like right as school was ending and letting out, I had my amputation, uh, which I always tell people, again, kind of like, your story with ACE being diagnosed, the amputation was the best part of 2013 for me. Mm -hmm. It was my favorite thing that happened to me in 2013 was getting my leg cut off because I got to be off chemo for three weeks. Oh, yeah. Like that's – and I still mean that to this day. Like I mean that so deeply in my heart mm -hmm. because that's how bad chemo is. Like getting my leg – cut off was nothing compared to that like absolutely not I was like like with the, I was like take it like no yeah. big deal I'll be off chemo for three weeks that's all I care about you know and um but what was interesting is after that things got infinitely harder after that from mental physical spiritual and emotional perspectives because the way it lined up and the timing and everything during the amputation recovery period I was actually in pretty good spirits because I was recovering from the chemo and my body was feeling more energy better than it had like ever had, you know, in the past several, several months, but I had graduated. All my friends were off doing their summer things. I wasn't incredibly mobile yet, so I couldn't go out and do a lot. Um, and then into the fall, all my friends went off to college or to get jobs or to start families or whatever it is they're doing. And all of a sudden, I mean, I, I, I still can't complain. I had an amazing community, amazing family, amazing friends that really made the extra effort to be up there and to see me and to stay in touch with me. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, I felt much more alone than I had previously. Not only that, I was recovering from a major surgery. And before I'd even remotely recovered from it, I was back on chemo again. Yeah. And it was night and day, the pre-surgery chemo to the post-surgery chemo. Even though it was the same regimen, my body was in a much different place. And so that's where it got really, really hard on me. But even then, battling through that side of it, there was nowhere near as intense as what it was to come out of that. Mm -hmm. And at first, I was really good coming out of like the ECMO and everything because it was like, my recovery, my journey back to health and physical and mental health was like, that was kind of my mission and my goal. And I largely have my dad to thank for that because he set me on that path. You know, they didn't think I'd be physically or mentally incapable of living independently for the rest of my life after coming off ECMO. And he started me from day one on that journey. And that really kind of became my purpose. It was when I went off to college that next year, in like September of 2014, that things got really really tough because now I'm around this entirely group of people my whole world has just been altered and everything that I've experienced nobody around me can even remotely comprehend right. for the most part you know and so, so there was a lot of darkness I slipped into from that 
level of, of isolation, you know. And it, Bridget is yeah. of the mindset of looking forward to yeah. going off to college where nobody knows her story. Mm-hmm. And she can just be known for her and not mm-hmm. the cancer kid. Yeah. Because she's kind of a local celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. There's a there's a lot of adults that, you know, go up to her and like, oh, Bridget, oh, you know, and because they're, fa- you know, they've been following her since she was two. Yeah. And, um, and she doesn't know who they are. Yeah. And she just wants to be known for something other than just yeah. having cancer. And I understand that perspective, too, so much. There, there were times that I felt that later on mm-hmm. in, in school and, and things like that. I don't know that I ever felt it probably as intensely as, as she does now, but I, I understand why she would feel that way, mm-hmm. you know, because now it seems like maybe she's to the point that, you know, for a while that was her only world. That was all she knew. And then especially as she grew up like with Brava, right? Cause she was a main driving force behind that, you know, again, that's kind of all she would have known, yeah. but then coming into teenage years, developing into an adult and learning her own, passions and interests and purpose in life you know I can see how she wouldn't want that as a representation of everything she is and I think that's perfectly understandable and I know that eventually she'll come back around to this is my mission this is my purpose um but right now I'm just I'm letting her you know if you don't want to if you don't want to go to relay next year I said that's fine you don't have to go um Ace is still of the mindset of yeah I want to go so I still got him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's awesome. It's really incredible of you from a parenting perspective to recognize that like, hey, this doesn't have to yeah. be my kid's purpose right now. Like I'm going to let her go off and, you know, explore her own things and maybe she'll come back to us someday. Maybe right. she'll find something else in life and whatever it is, you know. Right. It's going to be great. Well, here's the thing. She has a 50 percent chance with every child she has of having a kid with cancer with the same gene mutation. So um, unless she adopts, and I told her, I will love any baby you decide to give me. (laughs) Give me grandbabies. I'm fine with that. Um, But but, um, sadly, the battle for her will not be done no matter how much she wants it to be done. Um, You know, if, if she moves forward and decides to have children, this is going to be a lifelong struggle um because i i mean i know what it's like to be a kid i mean to be a parent watching your child go through this and that is not something i ever would wish on my children ever and i'm really glad you bring up that piece too the fact that it's a lifelong battle and i think i think it's something we've kind of passively discussed on this platform we've never really given it a lot of active dedicated time Mm -hmm. But it's a hundred percent true. It's something I'm still battling every single day. Mm-hmm. I mean, it took us three years of just heartbreak after heartbreak and almost eighty thousand dollars to have our daughter. And now that she's here, it's a hundred percent everything worth it and more. But to that was <laughs> I will say that was one of the hardest battles I faced from all of this. Mm-hmm was dealing with the infertility and going through that process and you know with Bridget being in a similar for her it's almost even more difficult because it sounds like it's almost like a moral dilemma of like do I try to have kids naturally you know right or do I not or like what's what's what do I want here what's the answer here and that has to be an incredibly taxing thing to think about you know it may not be something that's weighing heavily on her mind just yet it is but is it really <laughs> yeah you've yeah uh, we've already scheduled yeah. an appointment at our, our next um long-term clinic okay. they to bring in a fertility specialist okay. just just so that she knows her options yes. yeah well that's incredibly important mm-hmm. I, I think that's hugely important and mm-hmm. fortunately it was something that was discussed with me before treatment i'm infinitely thankful for that Mm -hmm. um, because we were able to take steps to make sure that I had options you know not everybody's given that opportunity and I know like that's something that's like weighed pretty heavily on you Austin in coming to the next steps of what you have to go through yeah looking at um, the treatment that I will be going through uh, after it's most likely confirmed of being a relapse will be the 
uh, an autol uh, autologous uh, stem cell transplant. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, six, <laughs> six days of high dose chemo, um, rendering a lot of stuff uh, uh, useless for temporary, but one of the permanent, most likely permanent side effects that I can go through is permanent infertility. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that was one of the driving factors for when I first relapsed this time last year, we wanted to see what my options were going to be for a second line treatment. The uh, autologous stem cell transplant was the uh, kind of the standard mm -hmm. second line treatment. Um, but we driving force of that and, and also, you know, the, the potentials for, um, for cancer mutations and just cancer re reoccurring, um, down the road as well is, is also kind of there. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to try and find something a little less impactful on the body. I still went through, um, we, we had found a clinical trial for um, CAR T cell therapy mm -hmm. uh, down uh, CD30 in particular, uh, down in Houston, tried that. It was only three days of chemo. It was immunosuppressant. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and and that uh, was was the step to try to, try to hold off the infertility. And it unfortunately um, did not work. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, yeah, infertility has definitely uh, been a buzz buzz topic for a couple of years now for me, which again is just another one of those mental side effects right. of, of going through these kind of battles, stuff that you just don't think about at first, but you know, it's just unfortunately something that you do have to face. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm certainly a late bloomer, you know, compared to, you know some of my friends in terms mm -hmm. of engaging in the more settled down kind of version of life um, and you know so a lot of some negative thoughts have certainly come into my mind uh, they come and they go in terms of like oh well why didn't you settle down sooner you know where's your wife where's the children where's the white picket fence um, and it's it certainly come to the degree now that it it, it, it does not bother me it still appears and mm -hmm. especially now with with having the realization and, and, and facing the reality of going through the stem cell transplant now, um, you know, but post post transplants, I, I have only a positive outlook and, you know, and with obviously technology in the coming times, you know, and discussions with Matt, you know, we, we have a very positive outlook about what could happen in the future. And, and it, it's not a guarantee of permanent infertility. Right. I'm 29. Hopefully down the road it can mean either we can try to recover something or, you know, something else pops up. But, you know, yeah, it, that's certainly one of the, the bigger uh, side effects that I've, I've had to kind of um, face, you know, directly mm -hmm. with this stuff. Yeah. Well, not only that, the, uh, you know, there's certainly that's one of the physical pieces, but there's also like the long term physical health, you know, right. and that's something I think that is used to be undervalued its significance only because kids were not tending to live that long after cancer. And now, again, it's good and bad, but now we have kids being cured like myself and living mm -hmm. so much longer, yet now I'm 30 years old and dealing with heart problems and all of these other things that, you know, I'm going to face the rest of my life. I've had this weird unknown illness for four years now that nobody can figure out. I've seen 10 different specialists and they all say, well, it's probably related to the chemo. Nobody can make heads or tails of it, you know? And so we're still trying to figure that out. And it's, it's always interesting to me, people. Then <laughs> this is one of the most, I'm a pretty easygoing guy. One of the things that like, I really have to work at that triggers me really hard that I've got to like keep my tongue bit on is, and it happens all the time to me is people will tell me like, like, Oh, you're 30 years old. You don't know what it's like to deal with like health problems or, you know, you don't know what it's like to feel pain or, you know, mm -hmm. and like you shouldn't be having any of this stuff. Like, like I'd give anything to go back to your age. You know, it's like, right. I get what they're saying and I can logically say like, just, I, I can hold my tongue on it. Mm -hmm. But man, to hear that is one of the most because it's and, and in a way I've tried to turn it around and take it as a compliment because I think people on the outside see me as such a a functional person nowadays mm -hmm. 
that they think like, oh, he's in just like supreme, pristine health. Mm -hmm. And what they're not seeing, they're not seeing the 20 plus different supplements, vitamins, medications I take every day just to keep my body going. Right. They're not seeing the mornings I wake up in just immense, immeasurable pain and it takes me two or three hours to become a functional human again. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not seeing the, <laughs> the doctor's appointments that I go to every single week to try to keep up with this. They're not seeing the, the AFib that just happens out of nowhere, but you got to just go right back to functioning normally, right. you know, and I've tried to do a better and better job of showcasing this stuff. Um, just to say like, Hey, this is still a journey. Yeah. I'm not done with childhood cancer. Like I'm going to battle this the entire rest of my life. And anybody who's ever diagnosed with childhood cancer will battle it the entire rest of their life. And so I was hoping you could actually speak a little bit more to, and I know this is a topic you're very passionate about, but the, the mental health piece of how this will follow you, it'll be something you fight for the rest of your life, oh, absolutely. both from like the child's perspective and also from you as a parent's perspective. So right now I'm dealing with um, some anxiety over the fact that Bridget's 18. I no longer have access to her medical records. I wow. no longer have yeah. control over her medical course of action. I suddenly went from doing everything to make sure this child stays alive to now she's responsible for it herself. Yeah. And um, the first time that, that, that I realized that, I was actually at um, um, the, the State House in D.C., talking waiting to talk to a, a senator there about funding the star act for childhood cancer research and um i was we were waiting outside in the hall and um this woman that i uh, met from cleveland and her daughter who was an adult now who went through pediatric cancer they were talking about how difficult it was because you know she's an adult and that transition was really challenging and that's when it hit me that in just a few short years, I wasn't going to be in control. I'm standing in the hallway outside of a congressman's or senator's um, office, and I start having a severe panic attack, like the kind where you fall to the floor and curl up in a ball and you're crying and trying to breathe and everybody's coming over and oh what's the matter is my like just just a panic attack it's just a panic attack and I go into this office and I had I had calmed down enough but you know I have the puffy eyes and I'm <laughs> yeah and um because this is this is um it, it completely 100 percent a control control thing um when you're going through treatment even as a caregiver, you don't have control over things and you struggle to, to find ways to have control over things. Um, one of the things that I always had to do was I always had to clean my house. I, I called it anxiety cleaning because, you know, before a scan, I got to make sure everything's put away and everything's clean because, and, and it's ready to go because what happens if we end up having to stay in the hospital for three weeks and somebody has to come into my house and try to find something so they can bring it to the hospital because that's happened before. <laughs> and now, I mean, I, I have heard somebody describe for a, a cancer kit survivor and for that matter, for the caregiver, it's not about worrying about what's going to happen. It's about remembering what has happened. And so, so you have to have this sense of control wherever you can get it. And even if it means the dishwasher's cleaned out, the clothes are put away, any sense of control. And all of a sudden, my kid not only is going to college next year, but oh, by the way, you don't get to control their doctor's appointments and make sure that they schedule them and make sure that you, they go and what is the doctor telling them and uh, okay they they want you to have this scan but oh my gosh you know are you going to have this scan it's just it's an all new level of anxiety that um that I'm learning about <laughs> and it it's it's not fun it's not fun 
That's wow. That's another point. I'm really glad you brought that up because that's something I've never even considered before. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> your poor mom and but dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's something I've never considered before. Tr- truthfully, because wow, as 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 a parent going through this, not only and I, I this is something I've r- loved to like explain to people is not only do you become used to fighting childhood cancer, you become really good at it. Like, and that's something Natalie talked about. Like you can look at any lab panel, know exactly what it means. You can look, you can talk with any doctor about any of the fancy lingo. Mm -hmm. You can say all the big words, all the diagnoses, you know, all about the surgeries and the chemo and everything that it's going to cause. And you know how to treat it and how to deal with it. Like you say, you become, you, you, find as much control in all the areas that you can and you become very very good at that Mm -hmm. so when that's taken away from you like it's another it's kind of corollary to what we talked about you know having this purpose and having this ability and Mm -hmm. having this skill you could almost call it and then not being able to use that or exercise that in any way um, I would imagine that has to be unbelievably difficult thing. What, um, what's been your like strategy so far for working around that, overcoming that? I am training my child to be an adult mm-hmm. with cancer. Okay. Sorry, an adult cancer survivor. Mm-hmm. Um, that is that is my goal. Okay. I have. I'm lucky in that she turned 18 before she started her senior year in in high school. So I have a whole year where I get to teach her how to take care of herself. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's stressful because the kid doesn't take care of herself. You know, (laughs) Um, she's doing better about remembering to take her pills Mm -hmm. and the, and so forth. So that's good. She's doing better, but just to, just to know you can't go a hundred miles an hour because you're going to crash. And just being able to say, yes, I want to do 10 different things this week, but realistically, I should probably only do six because 10 is going to overwork me. And then I'm going to be out for a week because my body crashes. So she needs to learn how to regulate her own mental health, not only mental health, but physical health. She needs to be able to regulate her time better. Um, she needs to be able to learn to say, okay, I can't do that right now cause I'm too busy. So she's got to regulate her time. And my goal is this year to, to train her to be an adult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a, a great way to like empower her to be able to, to do it, to have that control and to take that control for herself. Mm-hmm. Have you had any kind of conversation with her about like how difficult this is for you? I have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I pride myself on, um, always being open with my children. Mm -hmm. They always knew they had cancer. They always knew there was a risk of, of not surviving them, surviving their ordeals. Um, they've always known that no matter what, I'm going to have their back and we're going to fight. And um, so I have always been honest with her about my mental health too, because I want them to know that it's, it's okay to need help. It's okay to ask for help. Um, Bridget, God love her, has a problem asking for help. And so when she does, I, I try to move mountains to get it done. And unfortunately for her, she's just such a strong kid that oftentimes I don't believe her when she says she needs help. And so that's been a learning curve for me is realizing, okay, you, you got to take her seriously because the kid just was such a powerful two year old. I mean, you couldn't hold it, hold her down. Um, and so now she's coming into adulthood and she's, She's not feeling powerful anymore. And it is my job to make sure that she learns that how to get that power back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what happens in that situation, this is something 
I've dealt with, I know Austin's dealt with, I think pretty much anybody who experiences this deals with, you're, you're put in this crucible of a situation and all of a sudden your strength of spirit massively outpaces your strength of body. Not only that, your strength of body is reduced to a point. Yeah. Um, that can be different for everybody. And so you can derive a lot of power, a lot of strength, and a lot of impact from that strength of spirit that will spill over into every other category and will influence every other category. But it can become really difficult sometimes to have that high level in strength of spirit Mm -hmm. and to reconcile that with wherever your strength of body is. That's something we're always juggling, trying to figure out. And, And ultimately, a lot of our goal is to show that you know, you can build the strength of spirit up within yourself. That will influence your strength of body. That can help improve your strength of body. I know if, like, physically speaking, I would be nowhere near what I am today. Even though I still deal with a lot of challenges and struggles and detriments, I would be infinitely worse if I didn't have the strength of spirit that I have. And I think, you know, Bridget would probably be a lot of the same way, you know. But it is easy, and there you have to learn this balance of, How do I focus the strength of spirit and how do I put it into the things that are most crucially important to me? Prioritizing. Yes. Yes. That was the biggest skill I had to learn. It took me probably a decade to learn. I was the kid though that went to college and got over involved in every single thing and spread myself out infinitely way too thin Mm -hmm. because you go through cancer and it's like, that was really, really hard. You go to college and it's like an exam finals, like, What's right. that like? Worst case, I fail. Like whatever, you know. <laughs> I'm not gonna die. You want know? yeah. hey, to <laughs> yeah. join this committee? Yeah, exactly, join that exactly. Pre- president of two different organizations at the same time. Yeah. like why not? You know? Yeah, why not? So, uh, nice. so it, it is an easy thing to fall into, and I think what you need to do is not reduce the strength of spirit, but I think if you can focus it. Yeah, and that's an excellent point. Yeah, I think that allows you to be infinitely more effective. Mm-hmm. while still living living that piece that's inside of you. And so I need to, instead of saying, you can't do all this stuff, you can't do all this stuff, you can't do all this stuff, I need to say, focus on the things you really want to yeah. do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's focus. Instead yeah. of no, focus on yes. And this, and it will be a time for trials. Oh, but yeah. be okay with the errors. And all that does is just allows you to find out really what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, and that's the great thing about, you know, college and university um, is, is that it's, it's, it's a moment to breathe and just really, really get out there and, and, and find yourself. And I, I really, uh, I did that through like our international travels mm-hmm. from university. Coming from a small university, I never expected it. But now, now that I've, you know, looking back at it, it really, really really Im- immensely uh, helped fortify a part of me and and I think you know that ultimately helped me coming through or uh, coming in, into a diagnosis uh, diagnosis you know four years you know three or four years post but still it, it was certainly paramount what I had experienced there at university so I you know I really you know wish, wish the absolute best for for her Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's great. Like it should be a time to figure out like, what do you love? Try all these different things. But like you said, it's very important to learn and develop the skill and something I'm still working on getting better at, but working on this power to say no. Yeah. And it's not, this was the mindset shift I needed because I think when you go through this and you have the strength of spirit, the worst thing anybody ever can do for you <laughs> is to tell you, you can't do it. Because then you were just going to say, watch out and watch right. me make. But mm-hmm. if you put, if, if you go out and then have that attitude, like watch me make it happen, then you go do it. But it's not something really aligned with your purpose or what you want to do in life. Then you're just kind of wasting time and energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're not saying no because you can't do it. That's what I, I, I always thought of. If I say no, that means I can't do it. And mm-hmm. I don't believe there's anything I can't do. So what I needed to shift that to was it's, I'm not saying no because I can't do it. I'm saying no so that I can do these other things that are most important to me. That was, that was what I needed in the mindset shift that ultimately 
got me better at that skill and wanting to develop that skill uh, because it, it is incredibly important. And I mean, the best people in business, which can transfer over to a lot of areas of life, they will tell you the number one thing you can do, especially in the early years, is say no to everything but is what, but what mm-hmm. is most important to you. Yes. Because you only have so much time, you only have so much energy, you only have so many resources. Mm-hmm. You have to divert those to what's most important to you. But before you can do any of that, you have to figure out what's most important to you. Right. Yeah. There's, and that is one of those things that I call um, one of the blessings of cancer. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, there are blessings to cancer. And one of those is, you know, what we talked about earlier, not sweating the small stuff. You know, so what? You fail an exam. You're not going to die. Um, but it's being able to say no. Mm-hmm. I have absolutely no problems saying no. I just quit an organization that I was with for 20 years, not because I no longer believed in that um, that community involvement, none of that. It's because my priority right now is my kids because I've got one more year with Bridget and I've got three more years with Ace. Mm-hmm. So that is my prior- priority. I have every intention of going back to that organization again after they're gone. But right now I have to say no to them. And I cried when I turned in my resignation, but I said no to them because I, I have to say yes to, to being as much with them as I can. And that's, that's another huge skill. And maybe this is something we can discuss in regards to parents and caregivers, Mm -hmm. the same idea, but as it applies to your life, you know, I'm sure you've had, you know, you went through times where you became really good at doing everything. Like you were going to the doctor's appointments, you were being the mom, you were being the wife, you were running Brava, you were, which I definitely want to come back and, and talk about Brava towards the end here. But, you know, you're doing all of these things, wearing all of these hats, able to conquer all of these things. And so to be able to step back and recognize at the same time, like, I've got seasons here to what I'm doing, you know, seasons to my life. And right now you're in a season where you can spend time with your kids and you can help them develop into flourishing adults, which is such a massive undertaking. I can Mm -hmm. only imagine. You'll find out. to (laughs) To be able to step back and say, hey, I got to say no to some things, not because I can't do them, but because I can so that I can do these other things that are most important to me. I think I think that's huge because I see this all the time where people so easily allow themselves to feel trapped in a situation, whether it's like a job or a relationship or part of an organization, whatever it may be, they allow themselves to so easily feel trapped and, and they hate their situation in life and they're so broken down and beaten down by it but they don't feel like they have the power to do anything about it. Right. Because they just don't think they're allowed to say no. They're obligated. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's um that's a really unfortunate place to be trapped in and I, I I always try to think like how is it that people how do you get to a point like that? How do you get to a point where you start feeling like you're own self-worth and your own value is not important enough that it is so has such little importance that you have to sacrifice it for something else that you don't even care about Mm -hmm. and you know I don't judge anybody for being in that position because I I know that I've been there myself before I think the ultimate answer is just learning to see and find the value within your own self and recognizing that you're not going to hurt these people by leaving them. You know, yeah, you may be an incredible asset and it may be hard to find a replacement for you, but ultimately you're not serving the people who are most important to you to the best of your ability. If you're not taking care of yourself, Mm -hmm. that's why I've always said that the number one tool to lead or the number one skill to leadership is to lead yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't have yourself squared away, you're, health from every domain you can't be the best possible version of yourself for those around you right and that's going to be infinitely more effective than trying to sacrifice everything you are for those around you so i I think that's really great that you were able to come to that realization i guess i'd ask like because i think about you know we've been fortunate now 
on this side of our journey to become so much more close and in contact with parents of survivors. That was something I didn't have on the, the former part of this journey. I think now that I'm a parent myself, Austin and I are entering into our 30s and uh, oh, getting old. And... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now that we're, you know, like Younger we're getting heart. to the point where I see you more as like a peer than like right. a parent figure. And so we're starting to be able to empathize and relate to those struggles a lot more. But what advice would you give to parents? Because we have a lot of parents that listen through this, listen to this who are, some of them, their kids are actively going through treatment now. Some of them are years out from treatment, but they're still going to scans, you know, and I think, um, I think there's a lot of different challenges that come up. So what, what kind of advice would you offer to parents, not just for dealing with this in the short term, but also in the long term and, and exercising some of those practices of how do you let go of some of that control without losing yourself? but at the same time, keeping that purpose within your life and, and being able to trust your child in their own journey? That's an excellent question. I'm learning it as I go. And I think the, the most important thing I would be able to say is um, it's okay. Whatever feeling you have, whether it's, being overwhelmed, whether it's um, being sad, being angry. I think so many times we as especially moms, perhaps dads too, I've never been a dad, so I don't know. Um, but I think we're often expected to behave a certain way. And so therefore, the ability to say, I can't go to that event because I'm not feeling emotionally stable enough to do that is important I think being able to say I can't hang with my friends right now because I'm focused on getting ready for the next scan and I need to do my routine of of in my instance the cleaning mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> the laundry the dishwasher um I've got I've got um I've got so many people who have reached out and offered, hey, you can stay with me the night before a scan so you don't have to get up so early and so forth. And I'm like, no, I, I've, I've got to have that mental routine. And it's okay that I need to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's okay if you need to be on medication. That's okay. It's okay for you to go to the, your doctor and say, look, I'm not doing well. And I need some help. And it that's okay. It's okay for you to say to your friend, I'm not doing well, and I really need to just stay at home and relax with my kids. It's okay to say to your kids, I'm not doing well. I'm struggling right now. And so just let me have some 10-minute time, 15-minute time, an hour to myself, and then I will be able to be back and be a good mom. It's okay. And some days, okay is all you've got. Um, I mean, I've come home from work and had just horrible day. And I'm struggling with my own health and my own mental health. And, and you know, one of my kids, I'm not going to say who, came in and said, I don't want that for dinner. <laughs> And I mean, it was, it was like a box of mac and cheese or something. And it was just, I, and I looked at them and I said, this is all I've got to give right now. Yeah. It's this, or you're going to have to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This is all I've got to give. And that's okay. Yeah. A lot of parents have this guilt thing going. I, I'm guilty of it too. Where if you're not making the perfect lunch or the perfect dinner or the, you know, and you're doing it all for them, then you're not succeeding. But I think that mindset has to go away, especially when you are dealing with kids' health. And you can only do so much. And it's okay. Yeah. And it's so important what what you said there, how you handle that situation. Like... This is all I've got to give right now. I, th- 
I think it's so important to be real and honest. Like you say, you've been with your kids to show them that like you go through struggle and you go through challenge too. And sometimes, you know, there's only so much you can offer at any given point, Mm -hmm. but on the other side of that, like, here's what I'm doing to work through this. Here's how I'm overcoming this. Here's how I'm working around this. Here's how I can still show up and give the best of what I've got in any situation. I think that's so much more infinitely important of a skill and a lesson to teach a child than to try to make them believe in this fantasy that you're perfect and you never fail and you never falter right. and you never have challenge yeah. because when they then start to face challenge and feel imperfect and feel, you know, inferior and feel like they're not doing good enough, then they have a way to reconcile that. They have a way to understand like, Oh, my mom dealt with this. Oh, my dad dealt with this. And here's how they worked around it. And I can do the same in my life. If, They've always viewed their parent as like this perfect person who, you know, never fails, never goes through struggle, never, you know, has emotional battles, never has mental battles. Then they may think, why? What's wrong with me? Right. Why am I struggling with this? I've never seen my mom or dad struggle with this. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, as a parent, you have this urge to try to hide a lot of that stuff from your child. I think that's the worst thing you can do Mm -hmm. because your child's going to eventually experience some of that stuff the best thing you can do is to empower them with some level of skill to be able to face that and overcome it. By example. Yes. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I'm one of those who believes if you're in an argument with your spouse, it's okay to have it in front of the child. Yeah. Go ahead and have that argument, but make up as well. Mm -hmm. Work it out, talk it out Mm -hmm. and let them know that this is how, this is how you do it. You, You argue, you make up and you move on. Yeah. And, it's, it's just mind-blowing how they are, even when you don't realize it, they are learning from you mm-hmm. so intensely. Like, we're, we're in a stage right now where we're teaching our daughter how to smile. And it's like, that's one of the most amazing things we've experienced so far because, it's, you know, it's like we'll smile at her and she'll recognize you and smile back. Yes. And that feeling you get, is, there's nothing else like that. But that's just like the first stage of an infinite number of things we're going to have to teach her. And that's an immense responsibility, but at the same time, what an incredible opportunity it is Mm -hmm. to be able to gift what we've learned to her. And hopefully we can do it in the, you know, the best manner possible. But I think if you make your mission to teach your kid how to overcome any of life's challenges or even if it's not how to overcome them how to at least face them and how to find a direction to move forward in right you know if you can teach them that then all of a sudden they they're not alone it's something they maybe they don't have experience with but they knew their mom or dad had experience with it and so they've got somebody they can go to if they need they've got a sense of how you know somebody they deeply love has dealt with it before Mm -hmm. and you know they've at least got a path forward may not ultimately be the best path for them but they've got some way out they're they're not trapped in that situation right yeah so i love that advice you give and i think that's going to be so important for so many people listening to this not just parents but people who may be battling through challenges themselves right now and and one thing that i I just definitely want to bring up and then I want to give you a chance to talk about and just discover how the whole journey of everything came to be is Brava. Brava, I know, is an organization that um, you and it was you and Tracy that started it together, correct? Um, I can't even take credit for that. Oh, really? No. Okay. Um, so it was um, a couple of it was my brother's girlfriend Amanda okay, and her friend who were talking about the fact that, you know, they, they know Bridget and going through cancer and Ava was going through cancer and they said, wouldn't it be great to do a 5k and raise money for, for research or for kids? Um, and we could call it Brava. And I thought that was the dumbest name. (laughs) (laughs) I said, we're going to have so many people calling it Brava and we're going to have to correct them over and over again. But by golly, Brava 
stuck and I said, well, I'll be a part of it. I, I can't run it because I'm, I'm dealing with my kids right now. You know, I, I, I can't run it. And so Amanda and Elizabeth, they, they started it up as president and vice president. And Tracy and I were um, on the committee and we were working hard at it, but we were trying to, you know, keep our kids alive. Mm -hmm. So um, our friends did it. And, and we stepped in um, I, after Amanda and Elizabeth had done it for a few years and were off doing their own things. I took over as president and um, then I did it for a few years and then my kids were getting older and busier and so Tracy stepped in and took over and, and she has run with it and built it into what it is today. And I mean, the, the group of friends that she's got, the friends that I've got, the family that I've got, that have done this, it is all them. When Ace became, when Ace got diagnosed, I stepped back again and I mean, I barely went to a meeting. They built this. I am a worker bee now where I go out and they tell me what to do and I do it. And it, it's just such a phenomenal organization. I have never worked with a group of women more powerful and intelligent and caring and resourceful and you know we sit down and we say well this needs to be done and you know somebody says I'll do that I'll do that I'll do that and it gets done and it's fantastic we originally started this as a 5k you know we wanted to help one family yeah. and one family a year is what we thought we would be able to do and if eventually we made enough money, would be able to give to research so that we didn't have any more families that needed help. Our first year, we had three kids. Every year since, it seems like there's at least three kids. We've never said no. We've said, we got to raise some more money before we can help you, but we're going to help you. But we've never said no. And it has gotten to the point where, I mean, we are all volunteers. Um, and we get so many donations from the community that the majority of the money that gets donated to our organization goes to the kids in one form or another. We either adopt them and just give them a bulk sum of money and say, here you go. We do gas cards. We do gift cards. We do food cards. Um, we do. Uh, we used to do back to school time. We would give out money for kids going back to school um we give christmas every year we always give christmas money so that because because even though the journey is over for these families they're still recovering financially from the burdens of this and so some of them if, if they say we're we're struggling we we don't have money to pay the electric bill even though they've received the money previously we still do what we can to help them out again um it is rare that we ever say no to one of our our brave kids yeah. because if we've got it we're, we're going to give it um and then this past year we gave our largest amount to cure search thirty thousand dollars because cure search um, is an organization that doesn't just give to one hospital it gives to multiple mm -hmm. so um you know we're not focusing on one uh, type of cancer because we've got so many types of cancer in our organization with our Breva kids that um, it wouldn't be fair to get just give to one hospital when we've right. got multiple hospitals doing research. So, um, it, you know, you, you've been saying my my singing my praises about Breva and I have done so very little for them, and they have done the world for me. Because not just the whole empowerment thing, but it has, it, it has, um, it's just been such a joy to get to know these kids, to get to know their parents, to become friends with their parents, to see the kids thriving mm -hmm. and survive, not just surviving, they're thriving. And it is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, they don't, they don't often remember me, you know, as they grow up. Some of them do because, you know, I, I try to, um, I go through phases where I get to know some kids 
and I get very involved in, in getting to know their family and supporting and being there for the for their parents and all that. And so I get to know them and inevitably I get crushed. Um, we lose someone. We lose multiple someones and it hurts. And so I tend to step back and I don't get to know some of the kids for a while because it, it's hard. Um, but I always come back and I got to I gotta love on those kids because they're just incredible. Um, Ashton was hard. Ashton was hard. Um, he, you know, he goes to school. He went to school with Bridget. They weren't friends. They didn't know each other. Um, but the kid should be enjoying his senior year this year. And that's hard. That's hard. I'm sure in a lot of ways you see or you saw Bridget's journey and his journey and in him, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that would make it especially hard. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's why I wanted us to have some time to focus on this because, you know, even though there may be times where you step in and out of it or your role may change within the organization, mm-hmm. I've always been able to tell it's something that you have immense passion for. Oh yes. And I think that's just one of the most, <laughs> powerful things passion and purpose i mean those probably the two most repeated words on this show besides the word impossible Mm -hmm. (laughs) but those are such immense powerful guiding things Mm -hmm. you know austin and i had a conversation yesterday about this actually it's something that we're gonna bring to the show and talk about this is this this idea of so many people think what we should be chasing in life is happiness and we're kind of talking about that man that's kind of a it's kind of a weak thing to chase. And I know that sounds weird. That sounds like a harsh thing to say, but it's like happiness is so fleeting and mm-hmm. changing from day to day. And it's like you could go out and eat a box of cookies and it's going to make you happy, you know, for a mo- for a moment. Right. And, and and so it's like you you almost can't trust happiness. And so we've kind of been talking about this idea of chasing, finding something deeper for your life, something that's like fulfilling and sustainable and substance and for us that is passion and purpose to what we do I mean that's what we have for what we do here at impossible performance there are not always days that we're happy about what we're doing when we're (laughs) editing podcasts at 2 a.m and have to get up at 4 a.m for work you know so it's there are days where it's hard there's days where just like you talked about there's Mm -hmm. days where it's so hard um and especially those moments where where you would lose a child but yet you still have this passion and this purpose within it that I don't think will ever go away for you. And it's yeah. even the moment you started talking about it, it's like your voice lit up, your eyes lit up, <laughs> like you can just see it in, in who you are. And not only that, but I see it every time we interact at Relay every year. You know, it's always so fun for me because you're always about getting the kid's picture. Like, that's always one of your happen. biggest focuses. <laughs> and I love it because so many of the kids were just kind of like grumbling. We're like, yeah, oh, I don't yeah. really want a picture. No, and no. Um, what I think is so cool about those moments, though, um, you know, we had a um, new kid at Relay this year, Leo Zambori. Uh, Natalie Zambori has been on this yep, podcast. We talk about her all the time phenomenal member of our team she got to speak at relay this year Mm -hmm. and just unbelievable role model and powerhouse of a human being Mm -hmm. and her son is one of the most strong and powerful kids i've ever met too with how he's overcoming everything he's overcoming it but he and i were at um we're at relay this year and you know i i think he he might have been in the photo. I can't remember if he, he jumped in. He was? Okay. Mm-hmm. So he was in the photo, and I remember after the photo, we walked down to do the survivor lap, and he did not want to do the survivor lap because I think he's a little bit in this phase where um, Bridget is now where he's kind of like, he's like, I'm a cool kid. I'm a strong kid. He's like, I don't want to be seen as like the kid who had cancer. Right. I think he's a little bit in that phase. And again, that's perfectly okay. I 100% understand that. Um, but he's kind of sitting there by the survivor lab he's like i don't know if i really want to do it Uh, and i just looked at him and i said because i used to struggle with this and here's what made me reconcile it (laughs) i looked at him and i said hey so you do not have to do the survivor lap like i don't want you to feel any pressure to do it 
Like this is something you, a choice you make for yourself a hundred percent. But I said, one thing I want you to think about though. I said, your mom never missed a doctor's appointment. She never missed a treatment. She never missed lab work. She never missed a scan. She never missed anything. And she did all of that for you. And so I said, don't think about this as something you're doing for yourself. I said, think about this as something you're doing for her in a way that you can thank her for everything she's done because this is going to mean the world to her Mm -hmm. to watch you walk in a survivor lap. And I said, I know, I said, I know it sounds dumb to you. And I said, it feels dumb to me <laughs> sometimes. I, I get it. I get it. Because, you know, I'm like, I'm never like a, like, oh, I want to be paraded around kind of person either. Yeah. You know, you don't, it's hard to be celebrated for something you feel like you barely survived. Yeah. But I, I said, I, I, I 100% get it. But I said, maybe, you know, it'll feel a little different if you think about it as a way you can say thank you to her. Right. And like, it that was one of the coolest experiences for me. Cause I saw his brain turn and I saw it click in him and he like marched right up to that starting line. He's like, all right, we're doing this. You know, yeah. that was such a cool moment for me because it's like, it gave him a way to do that survivor walk and feel like he's doing it for his mom. Yeah. And like it, it empowered him in that moment. And that was just so cool to see from him. And I, I think it had a, really powerful effect on Natalie just to be able to watch him do that, you know, and it's, Mm -hmm. it's, um, one of these pieces I would just offer to anybody out there battling any challenge, you know, sometimes there's, there's pieces of it. We don't love there's pieces of it. We'd rather not do, but if you can think of things in terms of like, how can I pay back to, or how can I pay it forward to all those who have done so much for me? And that's just, I think there's there's a level of passion and purpose in that that you'll never you'll never find more fulfilling. So I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was a time you didn't want to walk with the kids up front. You didn't say it, but the look on your face was, "I'm in college. I do not want to be up with the kids in front, paraded around with all these little guys. Yeah. Give me a chance to go back there with the five year people, like I'm supposed to." <laughs> and I told you. I don't know if you remember this or not, but I told you it is so incredibly important for these kids to see you and more important for their parents to see you, that you survived. You are thriving. You're in college. There is life after cancer. And that's one of the reasons that I have the kids all grouped up because it's so very easy for people to say, oh, you know, kids don't it's very rare that kids get cancer it's not rare it's just no. not it and is if they get common yes mm-hmm. and if they get buried in the adults celebrating the one year and the five year and the 10 year if they get buried in that group during that survivor parade then it, it the it gets lost they get lost and they need to be up front where they can be seen and the the kids survivors who are now adults and are thriving need to be up there with them showing the other parents that are standing there cheering their kids on that there is life after cancer there has to be something next has to be so i'm so grateful that you accommodate me <laughs> <laughs> no that's i'm really glad you shared that because i'll be honest i don't remember that i've had that conversation I, I don't with just that. about every but team it's <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> though that like you saying that to me must have had a profound impact on me on the subconscious level i didn't even realize because that's exactly how i see the world now and that's basically exactly the words i gave to leo zambori you know but i never I wonder if that ever would have like fostered in me the same way you were still if I hadn't teen. heard that from you. you know? <laughs> no, but I think it's, I think it's one of those things where sometimes we feel like our words or our messages are lost on people, but I've always had this mindset of it's never lost. Like if they hear it once, it plants a seed that will mm-hmm. 
flourish someday down the road right with the right kind of trigger you know the right kind of water and fertilizer and, and proper conditions and so I'm so thankful <laughs> you said that to me back in the day because I just know I can remember back to that 2014 Relay for Life for whatever reason that's one of the things that's kind of st- stuck in my head from that mm-hmm. that whole time period and that whole journey um, I don't I don't remember those specific words but I do remember that I was like definitely would have been in the mindset of like, you oh, really I don't want to walk, I don't want to parade around. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think I would have been in that mindset. Um, but I know hearing those words would have given me a reason to be proud to be there. I'm glad. Yeah. So I'm thank sorry you, you don't that. remember it, but no, I'm glad. <laughs> no, I, and I don't think I need to remember it because it had a subconscious impact on yeah. me that has probably led to so much of what we're doing today. Mm-hmm. So deeply appreciate that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share oh before goodness. we wrap things up here? I don't think so. I think my phone is blowing up because I've got an appointment after this. Oh, but. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. Well, we'll wrap it up here pretty quickly. Guys, thank you for listening to this episode and checking it out. As always, the number one thing we could ever ask for you is if you found something impactful in your life in this episode and you know someone you think it would help, please share it with them. Our mission and our vision that we read at the beginning and end of every podcast is all centered around spreading this message as far as possible to help build as many people up as possible. And you are the number one way we do that by sharing podcasts, sharing posts, sharing everything we do. It helps spread this message and we could not thank you or have enough appreciation for everything you do to help us build this business and this brand and most importantly, this message behind everything we do. We want to spend send a massive thank you to our uh, sponsors and supporters for not just the show and what we do here, but for the Columbus Marathon and our efforts in spreading advocacy and awareness and raising funds for childhood cancer. Those are King and Fifth hats, which you see Austin and I wear all the time we're wearing right now. Um, incredible company, really centered around equipping people with the best products for every every situation in their life and not only that they are incredibly motivated and moved by what we're doing here what you guys are helping us do and uh, they've had made several ways to give back to our cause and we we couldn't thank them enough uh, for helping to spread advocacy and awareness in that manner Mm -hmm. you guys can check out the link in our bio use code performance 10 at checkout save yourself a little bit of money And our newest brand partner on board, who we have not officially announced to you guys, but we are incredibly excited to do so. You've seen us drinking them the last several episodes, but it's right here. Kinetic, uh, that, you know, you could call it an energy drink. I don't call it an energy drink. I call it a uh, performance drink because there's no caffeine in it. There's no caffeine, no sugar, no artificial colors, no artificial ingredients, no nasty stuff that you don't want to be putting in your body there's 12 grams of a patented blend of ketones that guys i'm going to tell you it is going to supercharge your brain Mm -hmm. it has actually pulled me and austin probably about 90 percent back on the amount of caffeine we were intaking we were intaking way too much caffeine trying to drive all this forward (laughs) like way too much (laughs) um but you know it was kind of our uh our one vice we're allowing ourselves to lean on and kinetic has almost instantly pulled that back Mm -hmm. Um, it helps with energy for training helps with mental clarity for performance you guys definitely want to check out the link in the bio we've got more stuff with them to come but we are very excited for this opportunity and they're also helping us out in our efforts to spread advocacy and awareness for all those battling childhood cancer absolutely not just the kids themselves but the parents Mm -hmm. the caregivers the doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, the foundation leaders, the friends, the family, the neighbors, everyone who is invested in this fight as Desney has perfectly laid out for us. It's not a fight anybody does alone. Research and progress and giving back is never done alone. But there are fortunately so many incredible, impossible human beings out there who are willing and ready to help drive this forward. So we are so thankful to all of you guys. And uh, Desney, I appreciate you really, truly for coming on the show, sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, you've been a phenomenal role model for us and everything we do. 
um, not just looking to see how you've built Brava into the what well, you've helped build Brava into the organization it is with so many other incredible people as you've mentioned incredible. and we are very excited um, to have some of those people on the podcast coming up for, in, in the future here. Mm-hmm. Um, but not only that, but just as a survivor, you know, we talked about, I think it was even off camera here, this idea that a survivor is not somebody who was cured of cancer and lives past it. A survivor is somebody who is faced with cancer, faced with the impossible as we would call it and chooses to show up and fight every single day without giving up. And yes, there are going to be days you want to give up. Mm -hmm. There are going to be days where you have almost nothing to give, but as you highlighted, that's okay. Because as long as you show up and give what you are able to give, to those and that which is most important to you in your life, you are surviving cancer. And that's not just limited to the people who are personally battling it. It extends to their caregivers, their family members, their community, everyone who shows up with passion and purpose for this fight to continue on, to motivate and inspire others, to bring the most positive influence and the most positive impact to health, both mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, to everyone involved in this fight. You are surviving cancer, and you are helping us to do so every single day. So thank you for coming on today. Thank you for being a part of this series. Austin, brother, you got anything else for us? Absolutely not. All right. Well, appreciate you guys listening to this episode. As always, thank you for everything you do to help us spread this message and this mission and this mindset because at impossible performance we are striving to build a global culture of strength fostering a spirit of growth in constant pursuit of the impossible thank you for listening and as always be impossible